This is part two of my interview with Dr. Stephen Lieb. If you haven't seen part one, click on the link in the description or on the link on this screen here. If you have seen part one, enjoy part two. And as ever, if you want to see more interviews with industry experts and thought leaders in financial markets, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit the notification bell now. And if you want to learn more about how to buy, sell, and store physical gold and silver, log on to goldcore.com, your precious metals experts. Just yeah. but bring the conversation back to gold, uh, and in particular, the idea of um, gold-backed currency. Um, do you think that it's specifically a move by China to a digital currency and in some way backing that by gold that is going to be the driver that will send gold higher? My guess is yes. Uh, and I, I did say so in my book. Uh, that you know, China will initiate a digital currency, and if you saw the uh, China one Chinese news organization <laughs> illustrating it, they had a cartoon. You can probably still find it on the internet, in which that digital currency is actually you know they use a uh, I don't know what you call it, an avatar or something to represent it. I mean, it's not physical; it's it, it's ethereal. It's your, your word, but they used a uh, you know a and representation of it as a physical gold coin hmm. and it was gold it wasn't yellow i mean it was bright shiny gold and uh that's where they're aiming uh and this is basically i'm just quoting the former head of the uh, uh people's bank of china you know in the wake of uh the i think in 2009 he penned a white paper in which he basically suggested he didn't use the word gold because that would be too provocative. But to find China using the word gold in the context of backing up a currency, you really have to look at Mandarin stuff that's been written in Mandarin, in which they actually do say that. Uh, but the uh, chairman of the PBOC, which was one of the most esteemed, uh, one of the most esteemed figures in China, uh, said Back in 2010, we need a basket of currencies like the SDR, and that has to be backed by some commodity. And uh, that is the way the world will run. And, you know, this sounds like a heresy, uh, you know, to have a basket of currencies. And when he said commodities, the only commodity that makes any sense is gold because every other commodity is needed. You can't have something backed by something that is going to be needed in order to run the world. You, you have can't to be have backed to be, by oil, for example. No, yeah, no, run out of oil. They want, mm. you know, yeah, very good, yes. It ha I mean, gold's the only one that fits the bill because it's, ironically, because it's prized for its beauty, much more so than for its industrial uses. It's industrial uses you can substitute, but you cannot... <clears throat> substitute for its intrinsic beauty. So yes, it's gold. And they've said so much. They've actually used the word gold back currency as part of the Chinese dream. Uh, the uh, party secretary in charge of gold has, has used that in Mandarin. You had to translate it. Uh, I did a couple of times uh, to make sure that I wasn't saying something that was way off. And uh, yes, I think it will be a basket of currencies. And that basket will be backed by gold. And that's not such a heretical statement. In fact, you know, history, and this I did not put in my book, and I wish I had, but the, 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 the best economies that we've had in this country, the U.S., I'm not talking about Ireland, but I'm talking about the U.S., uh, were uh, the economy, the 50 years or so that followed the Civil War. Uh, 1870, not quite 50 years, uh, to maybe 1910, to the beginning of, this, of the First World War, was gold back. That was an economy that was so good, that productivity grew so fast, that you actually had deflation in the context of very rapid growth because of productivity. I mean, it allowed prices to, to fall rather than rise. Mm. And <clears throat> that was... 40 years of, you know, a nearly perfect economy. When I say perfect, it, you know, there's a lot of corruption and everything else that went on the Wild West. I mean, people were, I mean, you know, terrible things went on. But as an economy, when you look at the metrics of the economy, 
probably negative inflation in some years and, you know, incredibly strong growth. That's what made America. America went from an emerging economy to an economy that was on the verge of becoming the number one economy in the world. Uh, and, you know, we saw that by, you know, uh, the Second World War, we had really, despite the depression, realized the, you know, our ascension. We were the number one economy. And the 30 years or so, or 20, 20 or 30 years or so after the Second World War, we were on a gold standard. And it was the Bretton Woods standards. It was a type of gold standard. And we, again, had a near perfect economy where we had relatively low inflation. I mean, there were periods of higher inflation, but they quickly were damped down without any problem. And we had uh, very strong growth. And it was across the, bird, uh, across the board growth. Everybody participated. Yes, people you know that, that, that performed better and that had higher positions, they got paid more. But instead of having 1,000 or 10,000 to one differences between executives within companies, the highest paid executive may have made 100 times more. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot. And the reason was that we had to be disciplined. That's what gold imposes. For some reason, as humans, if we're allowed to raid the candy store without any uh, attachment, without any consequences, <laughs> prohibitions, we eat ourselves we sick. <laughs> and, and that's what happened. When we were allowed to create as much money as we wanted, we created it and we found ways of using it. But those ways were not the productive ways of doing it. It's really not that hard to see. And, you know, we became very reluctant to, you know, adopt gold again because we were having so much fun, especially the people that it fed on itself because yeah. the rich got richer because they had access to the money. And, you know, Again, it all fell into place, and that's the thing: the rich get the rich get richer, the poor gets poorer. The the the, the gap continues to to, it, it to will, widen. Yes, it's just you know, it's it's human nature. Mm -hmm. It's not a comment about the America, which you know already had exemplified its you know its, its pioneer spirit. It was still alive in 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 uh, up through you know at least the mid sixties. And then we wanted guns and butter. We wanted Vietnam, we wanted to fight a war there, which I think, I don't think anyone today agrees that that was a good war to fight. Mm. But nevertheless, we were able to do it. We had the money and we also wanted to fund uh, Johnson's Great Society. Couldn't do both. And that's why we were forced to leave the gold standard. Maybe Nixon had a last chance to say, I'm getting out of Vietnam. Right now, here and now, this is a silly war and we cannot fight it and maintain our economic uh, vibrance. Uh, possibly could have, I don't know. But once we left the gold standard, there was no looking back. I mean, that marked the end of America as a great economy. I mean, the official end. And basically, it's been downhill since then in many ways. I mean, we, we have not really advanced our technologies to the extent that we should have. I mean, we should have been focusing on material technologies, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, technologies that we need for fusion. But there was no real focus on that. I mean, but that is, a, fortunately, a worldwide effort, I tier right now. But it's not going to be I tier that solves that problem. It's mm. going to be a, another kind of cooperation among countries in the world. I mean, fusion is a very tough problem to solve. And then going back to the idea of monetary uh, discipline, for want right. of a better You're phrase. Need it. It's probably not surprising then that that push for monetary discipline is coming from a communist, primarily communist country. It, it's coming from a country that, yeah, that that is is comfortable with discipline, that uh, can live with discipline. I mean, we can, mm. and we we proved it, and we might do a better job. We, I mean, ironically, if China is able to impose this kind of uh, uh, monetary discipline, the biggest beneficiaries might not be China, but it might be the U.S. I mean, I think we're a very creative population, and I think we've proved that over and over again. Right now, we're living with the creations that we created while the gold standard was prevalent. I mean, the transistor was born in the U.S. 
the uh, laser was born in the U.S. Uh, the Internet was born in the U.S. And I could go on and on and on. The number of Nobel Prizes that were won by Bell Labs in the U.S. is enormous. And uh, that all went by the wayside when we were off the gold standard. I mean, and Stephen, so you talk about the idea of this, uh, uh, this concept of a basket of currencies potentially backed by gold. So can we infer from that then if China is the first to go down that route, that in order for there to be a basket of currencies so that others are going to follow suit? Yes, I, I think they'll have to, because what you're going to see first with the digital currency is that it's much more efficient and much easier to use, not only in domestic transactions, but also in foreign transactions. Today, uh, the world is uh, run on the SWIFT currency, a SWIFT system, not currency. Mm. The dollar is the currency, the, the, the major reserve currency. But SWIFT is how we communicate with one another uh, and when we make foreign uh, transactions. And it's very cumbersome. Uh, digital will make that very simple. So they will automatically have a leg up. And uh, I, I don't think anyone's going to catch up with China. I think other people will present digital currencies, but um, they will not be nearly as efficient as the currency that China presents. And, uh, you know, we don't admit this to ourselves. I mean, Bloomberg had an article the other day saying that uh, if there was a full break in uh, uh, the world between, let's say, China and the U.S., the U.S. would make out better than China. That's ridiculous. I mean, China has much more trade with uh, other countries than, than the U.S. right now. The U.S. is a massive importer and uh, uh, of goods. And, uh, you know, there's no way they can, you know, really succeed if they don't follow suit. And the thing is, this is good medicine for us to swallow. Mm. I mean, we just, you know, just our own history. Forget about reading anything about China. If you didn't know a thing about China, you would read our history and you would find that though the, the periods of time, you know, covering 70, 80 years in the past, a uh, couple of hundred or a few, were, were when the economy really achieved something, when it really grew, were those periods where we were governed by the gold standard. It was only when we lost the discipline that we got out of it. I mean, there's something to pay for, for growing and for doing things well. And it's, you know, my word is discipline. It's not like I'm some sort of crazy disciplinarian. I don't <laughs> believe in corporal punishment. I, I don't even believe in capital punishment. I mean, I need basic, but you do need some basic discipline in order to run. I mean, you know, within your family, if you're going to let your kids run wild, they're going to run wild. And that's, you know, it, it's just the way of the world. It's the way of humanity. And the logic then behind um, your price range of five thousand to fifteen thousand dollars, maybe you might speak to that for a moment. Yeah, I mean, anything there is is kind of guesswork. This is not going to be, you know, your mother's gold standard. You're going to have to let gold float to some extent. I mean, if you use current prices of gold to try and and, and given the amount of gold, which is not that much. Uh, you're not really going to get there. You're not going to have a sufficient value for gold to back up the world's financial transactions. I mean, you may need gold valued as high as 20,000, 25,000 in time in order to serve as a backup for the entire world's, mm. you know, economics. And, uh, I don't know if that'll happen all at once or how once how fast it'll happen, but it'll take a much higher price of gold than we have right now. And it's just a question of multiplying what 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 amount of gold would be available as monetary gold and multiplying that price. Uh, you don't get anywhere near the world's gross product. Uh, you would have to have something like uh well, it could be 20,000. And, you know, 20,000 sounds like a massive number, and it is. It's a huge number. But keep in mind that financial assets between uh, um, the bottom, I'm talking about American uh, financial assets, between the bottom in 1982 and uh, uh, today, I'm looking at the Dow at 4,700. I mean, these are crazy numbers, 4,736,000. 
Mm. The S&P is at 4,700. That would be okay. If the Dow had gone from 800 to 4,700, that would, but the Dow has gone from 800 to 36,000. I mean, that, that's a lot more than eightfold. That's like, uh, um, okay, me. It's like 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 times 45 plus. 45 fold. I yeah. mean, if you do that to, to, to gold, well, you start maybe at, I don't know, mm -hmm. whatever number you start at, you're going to get a massive number in, in, in uh, you know. Over the so gold, so what you're saying basically is gold at $1,800 odd dollars at the moment is is cheap. It's It's extraordinarily cheap. And it's probably, I think there are two ways you're going to make a lot of money and protect yourself at the same time over the next 20 years, uh, uh, 50 years, if you will. I think you're going to have to own gold and I think you're going to have to pick your right technologies. And I'm becoming uh, more and more of the belief that, you know, in addition to those companies that, uh, you know, have, you know, viable solar uh, uh energies and viable so viable ways of making solar and making it still cheaper mm. uh they're small i mean the largest solar company i can find dedicated solar company that i can find maybe a company like first solar or they're not large companies i mean actually the big oil companies are the ones that you know may have the biggest stake in solar at the end of the day just because they're going to have a lot of cash flow from oil that they'll be able to pump into solar and to, into wind, et cetera. I mean, you know, you look at Germany, Dave, and they've been working at solar and, and, and renewables for, you know, a generation. They, they got the message 20 years ago, and they've been highly focused on that. Yet today, after, you know, really putting all this energy, so to speak, figuratively and, and, and in, you know, actual, in, into uh, uh, renewables, I mean, fossil fuels make up about 60, 65% of their energy needs. You know, this is a tough job and you're gonna need new technologies. And finding those new technologies and betting on them is going to be the way you keep ahead of the game. I don't think that the older technologies, which are information technologies, again, we'll see more improvement. Well, that they have a role to play. And, you know, their major role right now is to become more energy efficient. And, and that's a different role than they've had in the past, which was to become ever quicker, ever faster. And that, you know, accounted for why their prices kept dropping because they became quicker and were able to put more transistors in a certain area. And, you know, Moore's law, which said that doubled every 18 months. But if it doubles again, it won't increase the speed because now you're coming up against basic factors like too much heat. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, there's no way around that. You're coming up against real physical obstacles. But where the world is wide open, I believe, is in terms of material energy and material technologies. We haven't focused nearly as much on that as we have on information technologies. And I think now you're starting to see it. And MIT has come up, uh, yeah, an American, American company has come up. I don't know, China too, what they're, they're doing, but I'm sure they're doing great things as well. But I know that we've come up with using superconductivity to create these enormous temperatures that we'll need for fusion. And, uh, you know, it's complicated fusion. I mean, I don't, first of all, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a chemist. I, you know, I'm someone who studies economies, et cetera, but I study research and, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher and I try and put pieces together and I can see the complexity that's involved here. But it seems to, to in my opinion, in, in, in the wake of, of recent discoveries, and I'm talking very recent. I'm I mean, the last article I wrote, I cited uh, another article, I didn't go into detail in it, that was, uh, you know, came out in October this year, 2021. We're making progress as we speak. And you saw China land a lunar module uh, on the far side of the moon. That was, a, what, a couple of years ago. And there's a good reason for that, because there's a lot of helium-3 there. It's in the shadows, and that's where you're going to find uh, uh, the fuels for, I think, the new energies. And we're going to need that along with photovoltaics, uh, wind energy, et cetera. 
but we're going to need these new energies as, as a backbone so that we can continue to explore space to find other sources of copper, other sources of lithium, other sources of so many things that we're going to need to make this world sustainable. I mean, it's a terribly exciting time, one the, probably the most exciting time in the history of humankind. But it's also a time filled with threats, and it's going to be filled with tumult, tum tumult, whatever, T tumultuous. It's going mm. to be tumultuous. I have trouble with some words, <laughs> but uh, it, it's you know you're going to have to accept the good with the bad, and I think the way to get through it, to be very honest, is gold and a focus on the energies that have the most room upside. And uh, that's no longer information technologies. That's going to be material technologies. Stephen, where can um, our audience find out more about what it is that you do? Oh, StephenLeib.com. Pretty easy. <laughs> Just my name, nospace.com. Uh, and that's my, my website. And I, I think I just basically try and print you know, almost everything I do there. Uh, but, you know, from there, you know, if you really want to get into it, you're going to have to, you know, look into, you know, these experiments at MIT, do your best to find out what China is doing and, uh, and see how much sense it makes to cooperate. I mean, you can compete with China at the same time you're cooperating. And if we do have this gold standard, I know it's really bitter medicine and I'm coming back and repeating something for the US to swallow, but look at our past history. Don't mm. believe me, I've never been a gold bug. I was in a gold bug in the, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I predicted uh, one of my predictions I'm proud of is I did predict the secular bull market in the 80s when I was writing a, a book on that. And uh, I, I, there were no gold stocks in my book. I mean, I, I was never a gold bug until maybe the early part of last century. Maybe, uh, you know, when I wrote uh, Defying the Market, you know, the fall of the dot com bubble, et cetera. I just saw that there were limitations. And I think. The, the, the probably the best prediction that I've ever made was I said that information technologies would not be sufficient to deal with potential commodity shortages that we were mm -hmm. likely to face. You're going to need. I, I didn't I don't know whether I ever spelled out the kind of material technologies that you would need. But I did spell out how far away for, from making that uh, viable we were. And. Um, that's still the case. I mean, we should have been spending the last 10 or 15 years developing our material technologies that, you know, but there was no money in it. Now, you know, there's going to have to be money in it somehow, some way. We're going to have to make that a very credible venture and very profitable uh, uh, for companies to do. And we're going to have to figure that out and do it within the constraints of uh controlling the amount of money that we spend. I mean, we can't go wild anymore on, on the, the, this crazy, these crazy expenditures, creating these layers of bureaucracy that we've done in the wake of coming off the gold standard. That has to be done with. And you know what? We'll have a better education system. Everything will be better if we can do things in a disciplined way. And the whole world will be better. And we have to think in those terms a lot ahead of us. And a lot of, you know, things that we're not going to do very well at first, but uh, we will get the hang of it. I have a lot of faith in America. I have a lot of faith in the world. I'm going to put a link to your website in the show notes in the description below here. And just to remind people again, the most recent book is China's Rise and the New Age of Gold. There's also yes. Red Alert, which was uh, 2011. And... Uh, the Coming Economic Collapse, this is a book that I read when you released it first that uh, heavily influenced my involvement in commodities in my career. So thank you very much for that. But for now, I just want to say, Dr. Stephen Lee, thank you for being with us on Goldcore TV today. It, it was a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. I really did. And uh, it, it basically, when you ask questions, it gives me a chance to think about things. And I think I learned something being on the show. I mean, again, I have mentioned material technologies a lot, but not in, in not not as a focus. And I thank you for giving me a chance to realize that, you know, 
that is a focus. That's where we have to come around to a focus on material technologies and less of a focus on uh, uh, information technologies. I mean, I've been saying that, but not in so many words. And you gave me a chance to say it in so many words, exactly that. And I thank you very much for having me on your show for that. You're I very really welcome. Do. If I played a small part in that, I'm absolutely you delighted. Did. You played, <laughs> you, you played a, a very important part. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. That was probably one of my favorite interviews. And if this is your first time here and you enjoyed this content, please like this video, share it with somebody you think might enjoy it. Leave a comment below because that helps tell YouTube to share it with other like-minded individuals. And as ever, if you want to see more interviews with thought leaders and industry experts in financial markets, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit the notification bell now. And if you want to learn more about how to buy, sell, and store physical gold and silver, log on to goldcore.com, your precious metals experts.